Hello and welcome to Cyber Made Human, episode four. I'm your host, Alice Violet. I'm a creative who primarily works with cybersecurity brands doing podcast production, video, photography, and it's all about storytelling, um, basically complex and technical topics in a way that's easy to understand and memorable. So I'm delighted to be joined by Florin today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Alice. And I'm very excited about our topic today. This is a special episode that's at the South Gloucestershire Business Show. So if the acoustics sound a little bit different, that's why we are live. And you might hear some of our lovely um, audience in the background sometimes. The podcast is called Cyber Made Human. And that's because we often hear that the weakest link in cybersecurity is the human element. But I think that's actually quite unfair because if it wasn't for the human element, none of this would exist in the first place. And all of the innovation that we've seen in this space is also due to the human element. And so focusing on it in a negative light, I think is a bit unfair. And also as children, we are all creative. So when we were children, we painted, we drew, we danced, we broke things. And all of us are encouraged to do that as children. But as we reach adolescence and adulthood, we put ourselves in boxes of I'm sporty, I'm technical, I'm creative. And I don't know what you think, Florin, but I think that we are all of these things and we don't need to see cybersecurity as a purely technical industry. Absolutely, Alice. Um, I think it's a very, very important topic. And I also like to say that uh, we've had a little bit of this conversation, you and I, before. Yeah. And it could be interesting for our audience to kind of catch up what we were saying. So I'd like to frame it from the point of view of the convergence between creativity and technology. So you're correct. You know, when we're growing up, we're much more gifted as children and then we're pigeonholed. And we're specialized because of the depth of complexity of our society and all technology, right? But if we go back in history and look at the greatest periods of achievement and enlightenment, uh, the classical, you know, Renaissance um, from Da Vinci, who introduced, you know, proper perspective and geometry and introduced painting techniques to give depth to painting, revolutionized, right. you know, technique. Or Einstein, who was a patent clerk, uh, analyzing, you know, patents at the time, uh, the, the Swiss were trying to synchronize uh, clocks between train stations. So he had to bring in imagination. What would it be like if he was riding on a beam of light in order to understand deeper? So basically, um, as you say, you know, in cybersecurity, we tend to think of it as a technological duty of those who are learned in the, in the space. But in, in reality, it's really a canvas that is open for innovation. And, and what the message I think is very important to bring today to, to this discussion is that human creativity, starting with each one of us, mm. is what will transform our culture into a culture of security and will change the game. So hackers have been very crafty in learning how to social engineer us. Mm. So we have to learn how to hack the hackers how to dupe them, you know, how to deceive them. And there's so much more to be said about that. Before we move on to social engineering, I love the way that you have framed it, you know, in line with the Renaissance and things like that. And I think that's why we connected because we both love art and we both we work do. in this space. And I think it's a really interesting point because, you know, when we look at these amazing paintings or architecture, and as you're talking about the depth of field and how things are presented, we see that as creative, but it's very technical. And I think the reason that cybersecurity is seen as technical and not creative is because the architecture is digital and also the language is quite complex. Um, and that's kind of combative to potentially creatives moving into the space. Whereas actually, if you're somebody who thinks outside the box, wants to do things very differently to how they've been done before, yes. you are creative, even if what you're building is digital. Yes, very much so. And uh, another one of the chief elements of these periods of great creation, which I think we're undergoing one right now, I, I would say that we're yeah. living a technological renaissance with so much discovery mm -hmm. that is leaving a little bit behind the human question. So I think that cybersecurity needs to be more open and practitioners of cybersecurity need to be more open to this multidisciplinary approach, you know, to realize that in a company, it's up to all of us to change the way we deal with email, uh, to invite different parts of expertise, you know, in terms of social sciences and law. So I think a very important area that we should emphasize, especially being at the university, right, is the role that imagination in students, you know, the ability to invite them to become innovators. Yeah. We need to face a very serious challenge in cybersecurity today because the landscape was basically rapidly evolving. Nobody could imagine that we would have over 5 billion users online. 
when DARPANET first emerged in 1972, nobody would imagine we would have this number of connections. Mm. So we're faced with a very uh, deep technical challenge that requires creativity in coding, and it requires more innovation. And I think we're going through a period of great innovation in the UK, but we need fresh minds to yeah. join the fight. I think that's a really interesting point. We're at the University of Bristol today at this um, South Gloucestershire Business Show, and it's an important point about not only creativity in the industry, but with students, because a lot of students who are thinking that they want to study, they might think that cybersecurity sounds really dull or very narrow-minded or very technical, and maybe it is. Maybe we are at a point where in education, if you were to study information security, maybe they're not very creative degrees, and we need to look at it from, you know, right at the root of when people are getting into this industry, when they're learning their education in a business degree. We asked while we were waiting to set up, we asked some of the students in the room if they knew about cyber and they were studying business and the answer was no. And it's about ensuring that business uh, cybersecurity is included in a marketing degree, of a course. business degree, because it's intrinsic to everything. It's not a little add-on or a separate thing altogether. Exactly. It needs to be the same, especially if those people are to go on to become CEOs and leaders of companies, they need to know about cybersecurity. They certainly do. They certainly do. And before we started the podcast, we were asking some questions to the audience today. And, and it seems that it's still quite uh, isolated. It's still, you know, very much a field uh, of technical expertise. Mm. However, um, <clears throat> the challenges that we face today requires all of us to participate and to drop this fear of the technical barrier and understand that we all have email, we all interact with applications, right. and it could be one of us in a company that clicks on the wrong email and compromises the entire company. So the way that we approach our own security makes a huge impact in the company, and the way we talk about it with our friends, the way we share you know, videos, and the way we share on, on applications requires us to think um, more as a team, you know, Team UK, we're, uh, we're facing a landscape of increased cyber threat across the world, you know, and we have state actors that have invested very heavily in, in hacking us. So I think it's a time of coming together, and it's a time for students and edu educators and inventors to come forth and think outside the box. So the fact that you're more humanities-oriented you know, or business-oriented may give you an edge. Yeah. that you might not be, you know, boxed into a certain technical, you know, field. Um, so I think it's a call for innovation. It's a call for becoming uh, more uh, adaptive and, and, and to basically think outside the box and invite um, the cybersecurity industry to play a greater role with universities, you know, to have more hackathons, to have bounty hunts, to make it more attractive and profitable for us to participate Right. And I think we're in that transition. I mean, that's something that I was going to touch on is with kind of the reason it might be not as compelling potentially for young people is that cybersecurity is seen as a defensive industry rather than an offensive industry. So we're not proactively doing stuff like in marketing. I'm a creative. I clearly do marketing and make content. Um, and so I'm deciding what I want to do. I'm sort of making a strategy and building the stuff based on what I'm interested in. Whereas if you're in cybersecurity, you're looking at what already exists and reacting to that. And that's a different approach. And do you think there is scope in cybersecurity to be more kind of proactive in leading the way? Or do you think it does need to be a reactive industry based on what's happening? I wish it's exactly as you said. I wish we were more proactive. Okay. Uh, for example, we were just at Think in London with IBM. And the head of security told us that the average number of days for companies today to find they've been hacked is 277 Whoa. days. It's almost a year. Yeah. So big companies are getting hacked. We don't, know, we don't even know they're there. And they're so creative, you know. So hackers have come up with ways to hack us with what's called fileless virus. So they're AI-driven, you know, um, viruses that are in our systems. So I think we have to, um, you know, basically reach deep inside and see how this affects us. You know, it's horrific to, to lose an account. It's horrific, you know, the shock that comes from losing uh, access to your credentials. Something I never want anybody to experience, you know. It's just so personally, you know, <laughs> uh, upsetting. And, and as a country, you know, the hacks that we had and that we have to defend against, you know, pose a big threat. 
mm. at the same time as an opportunity in education today. And so, for example, in this region, you know, in, in the southwest, you know, we have Golden Valley, which is an amazing development of, uh, of synergy, of convergence, right. where a lot of different members of the cybersecurity industry are coming together. And with the proximity of universities and programs in universities, you can be part of that. So I would, you know, advise young people to have another look at it and to understand that you can make a change and that there's so many aspects of it where you can become engaged, where you don't need to be a coder, you don't need to be a propeller head, you know, necessarily to make an impact, to make a change. And I think it goes the other way as well. Like if you are a code specialist, it's about looking at communication and things like that as well because there's lots of businesses that I work with that are cybersecurity companies and the people are incredibly technical and technically minded but they can't communicate their message very clearly so when they're selling their services to users for example when they're talking about threats it's like they don't understand what on earth you're talking about so you need if you're a technical person you need to be able to communicate and we talked about this a bit about this earlier about the power of storytelling and I was working on a podcast yesterday which was about sustainability and they were talking about a similar thing where when we talk about sustainability we all know about it but it's sort of there's a lot of parallels between cybersecurity and sustainability sustainability people see it as someone else's problem it's for someone else to think about both things need to be intrinsic to everything and I think the way that you get that across is through the power of storytelling so using examples mm -hmm. that I can I can relate to my real life not just using technical terminology that I don't understand yes yes no I think storytelling is extremely powerful and also how do you communicate your uh, your needs to your colleagues in a company and, and even now, you know, how we're talking about what is the threat? Do we really perceive the level of challenge that we're against and, and the need for us to really stand up to that challenge? You know, so I think that art is, an, is a very interesting aspect of this and coding, they go together. Coding can be viewed as a different form of poetry. So I'm intrigued by that then, go on. So, you know, coders, you know, may, may understand code as poets understand language. Mm. So it's an entirely different world that uh, that can be shared through, for example, AI art. And so uh, we see a lot more manifestations of the symbolic and in encryption, you know. So, for example, in, you know, in Britain, we're very good about word uh, puzzles, you know, crossword puzzles. And, you know, of course, that's a long, long legacy in, in, in Bletchley Park and in, in, in different historical efforts that we've made. You know, we're gamers. So if you're a gamer and you're very good at gaming, you know, this could be an interesting segue into cybersecurity. So there's a moving field that has a lot more entry points than ever before. And there's also a spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation, which I think calls uh, us to all participate. And we're in a region where investment in this area is, 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 is very large. You know, there's more and more commitment, you know, with the proximity to Cheltenham and with so many accelerators and programs. So I would urge, you know, young minds, young people to think of yourself and look at the, the power of creativity. I was telling Alice, you know, if you walk through the British Museum of Science, you see a very interesting story of creativity, you know, from the steam age to the age of electricity, to the age of uh, internal combustion and the progress that we've made Nowadays, our progress is a little bit less visible because it's all in semiconductors. It's away in those foundries. It's in your phone. But we can still have a big impact. And so I think there's the convergence of right brain, left brain. You know, Einstein said it. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Imagination is where, you know, these creative ideas that are going to make a difference, that are going to unlock the power of the internet and unlock the power of AI and, and self-driving cars is going to come from. The American consulting company McKinsey estimates that if we were able to solve 50% of the cybersecurity problem today, we could create a bounty of about 10 trillion pounds by 2032. So it's an incredibly necessary and incredibly uh, dynamic battle that goes on every day that we're not very aware of. We're just kind of skimming the surface. But it's a field of opportunity, and, uh, and I think it's open for all of us 
to adopt a greater culture of security. I think there's so many things I could touch on there. I'm not sure where to begin. I mean, when you mentioned the Museum of Technology, yes. I'm a big fan of Victoria and Albert Museum. That's my faith. Um, but I'm definitely going to visit that because Highly I am a lover it. of art. But this is, you're totally right. And I love that quote that imagination is as important as knowledge. Yes. Because especially in this space, this is a very young industry. And actually, one of the questions that I have for you is about diversity in cybersecurity. Because we're a young industry and it's very entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial like it's I do think it's very creative space there's so much scope you know it's no day is the same there's constantly evolving and changing especially with AI it's accelerating very quickly right now mm -hmm. um why is it that we're not seeing more diversification in the industry because you you would think that it could attract more people. I mean, for example, when I worked at Sophos, I used to roll in at 10 a.m., sometimes I'd leave at 11 p.m., sometimes I'd leave at 4 p.m., and my manager didn't care because she understood I was a creative, and as long as I did my work, it didn't matter. And I think tech brands are like that, so you'd think they'd be more appealing to women who've got children, mm -hmm. people who are remote workers. So I'm, I'm saddened by the lack of diversity and the slow progress we're making in that space. Well, um I would think that it's making, a, that it's already happening a change. For example, at IBM, you know, I think we see a lot of what you were talking about. So more remote working, you know, more maternal leaves and, and ex experts working from home. Um, I also see a lot more colleagues coming in from different areas, you know, from, you know, India, for example, you know, there's a lot of British Hindus that are coming into coding. Okay. So there's a very diverse, you know, both ethnically and, and male-female uh, force, I think, that's building. It's just hard to see because, so? yeah, cybersecurity is not something we talk about, you know, openly. It's because it's related to security. We tend to kind of compartmentalize it and it's not so open. But, uh, but it's happening. It's certainly happening. And I think it's creating a lot of jobs and a lot of opportunities to enter the, um, the field. But uh, what I'd like to go back to is a little bit of, ab about this mystery of encryption, you know, of cryptology. We're at an age where, you know, we're basically sensing that if we uh, actually build a quantum computer, you know, this could do away with all of the existing encryption. Imagine that, you know, we're, we're in a similar race as in World War II for the bomb. You know, this is the digital bomb. If somebody is able to actually build a computer according to the Peter Shore, you know, principles, you know, and Feynman's principles, we could suddenly decode everything and, and everything would be open. So there's a race on that is similar, you know, to what we've seen in the Lord of the Rings. You know, <laughs> we have to get to Mount Doom and, and, and get the ring into, into the volcano. So, so on that... I would love for you to give a bit of an introduction about what you're working on in the quantum space and also for anyone who doesn't understand what that means, yes. in kind of simple terms, how would you articulate what you're working on? Well, so we're having a quantum renaissance, as you all have heard and known, and the UK government has made a decision to lead this space. So the National Quantum Strategy has laid down you know, some very big investments and some very big principles. And there's many groups working on both quantum computing, quantum communications, and quantum sensing in different ways. Uh, we're a small startup based at the Bristol and Bath Science Park, and uh, we have a subsidiary called Quantum Light, and we're specialized in optical communications. So how we can create a system that's scalable, that's adaptable, that's easy to install, and that hopefully by next year, <laughs> We will be able to tell you that it's already operating in telecommunications and it's securing our networks. And then touching on what you were talking about earlier when you said about gamification and about people who are into gaming, this is an industry that's quite suited to that personality. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think with the pandemic, the younger generation have been very exposed yes. to digital lifestyles, even if they're not into gaming, all of the social media and learning online. And I think one of the ways that cybersecurity can effectively educate is through gamification. Yes. So like you said about um, doing ethical hacking and bug bounties and things like that. Could you just, for anyone who doesn't really understand what that looks like, give kind of an introduction to it? Yes, well, <clears throat> I, I think that the, uh, the gaming industry has been fundamental in the development of artificial intelligence. So a lot of people don't realize that, you know, the animations that we see today in games, the, how fast, you know, the landscape is moving and changing versus the very jerky, you know, I don't know how many have used some of the old games, 
but in the old days, terrain was very clumsy, you know, it was very blocky, right? And it, it would stall all the time. And in order to make that move very fast, we needed to create uh, what's called GPUs, which is graphical processing units. And, uh, and, and in order to get that fast, we needed to basically move the processor into memory. So most computers, traditional computers, you know, have a processor over here and RAM over there. And there's a bus, you know, that's basically bringing back and forth data as it's processed. Well, that's too slow for gaming. It's just way too slow. So gaming industry created a, a system where the processor is inside of memory. So you can address whole points of memory simultaneously. And this had a huge impact on artificial intelligence. So that's one way in which gaming has completely changed things. But also gaming from the point of view of John Nash, you know, from the mathematical point of view, of understanding scenarios, of uh, thinking things that people don't realize could be a problem, you know, black swan events. So we need a lot of fresh thinkers. We need to incorporate more young people into internship programs. We need to invite people from the humanities to also consider the ethical and the philosophical aspects, you know, uh, of our avatar. You know, we all have a digital avatar. You know, how does that avatar behave, you know? And uh, so, yes, gaming and the ability to have more hackathons. Yeah. So I'd like to encourage, you know, and maybe we'll come back some other time to the university with a hackathon, mm. which could be quite interesting, you know. Yes. Right. So a company would put out um, some new software, for example, and invite people to try and find their weaknesses and then tell them about it. That's right. And that's really a really good way of them making sure that they're secure, but also inviting other people to get involved. That's right. Ethical hacking, white hat hacking penetration testing, pen testing, all these different things. So we need to basically convince the other wise black hat hackers that would have yeah. gone rogue to join us on the white team, you know, that, uh, that there's equal opportunity for profit legally made. But do you think they're different made. people, really? I mean, actually, that's something that I'd like to have on the podcast is some, like a former hacker. And I have had somebody who was a former phishing scammer, James Linton, in episode one. Wow. And he talked about, I don't know if you know of him, he like tricked the White House. He did loads of really interesting things. And going back to what we talked about earlier with humans being seen as the weakest link. Yes. And with phishing scams, people can be quite critical of if you fall for a phishing scam, you're really dim and things. Well, he had people at the White House falling for phishing scams and people who are definitely trained in cybersecurity yes. falling for them and so it's a really i think with gamification it can be as simple as doing a simulation with your company where you say can you spot the issues with this what's the risk on clicking on the links and things like that just very simple practical activities so that people can learn what you actually mean when you say a phishing scam so i think companies should uh, take on themselves to have continue just like we have fire drills could be interesting yeah. to have cyber drills. A bit more fun than a fire you know, drill, hopefully. Uh, most companies are not prepared for a ransomware attack. You know, and no. if your files get encrypted, that's it, you're toast. You know, I've seen whole, you know, servers, racks, entire racks, you know, where their SATA control, you know, units were completely toast. You know, they had to actually replace hardware to get back into their drives. But if you had a backup strategy, that involved everybody, you know, that it started at, at your desk. I think that could change. But yes, I think it'd be quite interesting, you know, to do a lot more interactive cybersecurity. Totally. And I think we're at the right time, at the right place, you know, with the right players and, and, and with so much support from the UK government and from the uh, National Cybersecurity Center and the uh, Cyber Council and uh, Sinam, yeah. we're a friend, Reed Darby yep. and his very creative. He's who introduced us, isn't he? That's right. Reed, one of the most creative Cheltenham curators. I think he runs the uh, cultural foundation for them. So there's a, definitely an overlap. And art is the world of symbolism, and encryption is too. And so we're moving away from you know cryptographic, you know um, limited term sets, and into visual uh, optical encryption, and into quantum encryption. And, uh, and there's so much for, for artists, you know. I've also seen the emergence of AI artists, like mm. Miriam B on LinkedIn. I don't know if you've seen her. No. Some amazing stuff. It's a, it's a topic that I think it's a little bit touchy because it has to do with security, and we're all very serious when it comes to security, uh -huh. you know. This is the fire marshal. But I think we should start with our own security. 
and visit you know the uh, the different uh, assets that are out there the cybersecurity center self assessment and uh, and basically keep yourself safe and use whole practices you know download a VPN for your phone virtual private network Vir virtual private network is something we can all do yes um, we can start a no click policy you know I have a very extreme no click policy which is I don't click on emails period Really? Yeah. So it's like a friend of mine says, but I'm sending it to you. He says, I, I don't care. I don't know if it's really you. Yeah. So that could be a little bit extreme. But I think we should take ourselves, you know, more seriously, protect our assets, protect our digital world and uh, and be more part of a security culture. I think going back to what you mentioned about Cheltenham earlier, I might be biased because I'm from Cheltenham and I do work with Sinam and things yes. like that, work from Hub 8. Um, yeah. But it's a really good example of blending creativity with cybersecurity. I do think Cheltenham kind of embodies that because it's a festival town. We've got the Literature Festival, Science Festival. Mm -hmm. We've got Golden Valley coming. We've got GCHQ. It is kind of a population of people who are cultural, I was going to say cultured, but interested in culture, yes. but also work in technical roles. And I think that kind of hybrid approach to personality and acknowledging that, you know, when they're making events, they want them to be also attracted by also creative people they don't want just cybersecurity people attending their events and i think that's a really interesting approach actually indeed 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 so britain has a uh, amazing tradition of cryptographic knowledge of information security you know we created shannon we created Turing. so the birth of, of ai is really you know in this country um, so many advances in computation are taking place in our region. Mm. You know, the new Isenbart 3 AI exascale computer is going to be built in, uh, in Bristol across the, park, the car park from us. Oh, uh, really? Yes, a big investment. You know, the biggest AI computer in the UK is being built. So you can be part wow. of that. And of course, this campus is a smack in the middle of that. And one of the best and, and, and brightest and most needed applications for AI is for cybersecurity. So we need to basically think out of the box. We need to become part of this entrepreneurship movement. And, uh, and we need to get out of our comfort zone and understand that it is a national challenge and that there's so many resources out there for you if you're willing to, uh, to try something new and to kind of become a little bit more open to uh, to this space yes so what advice would you give to people who might be later in their career they're not young people they're already in a job and they would love to transition into cybersecurity. all young people you know obviously education but if you know what advice would you give if you kind of think i'm not a technical specialist well this would be people of my age <laughs> but i but i've gone and and, and been, become an entrepreneur so i'm, I'm both roles but i think yeah. that people who have already been in industry who are basically looking at a second career or you know that part are critical for communicating to company boards to the c-suite these kind of topics so usually i'd say that these executives are very skilled in communications they know corporate culture. Um, they probably have the connections, the, the relationships. So you could become a consultant and bring in the technical people. You, I think, can have a, a practice, a home practice, you know, a home office, um, just basically representing different cybersecurity vendors yeah. and, and communicating to companies, to boards, you know, the need to adopt these tools. So there's an opportunity, of course, for executives, former executives. Yeah, and I also think that quite often I, when I'm at events and things, I hear people giving talks and they'll preface everything they say with, I'm not a technical specialist, but, and I've banned it from my vocabulary because I'm not a cybersecurity specialist. I am a marketer and a content yes. creator, but I do know enough about this industry and in no other world would you preface everything by letting everybody know you're not a specialist there. And I think we need to stop seeing cybersecurity as some different language that only certain people know about. Yes. You know, if you worked in this industry for 10 years in a creative role, you're still in the technical industry and you should feel proud of that, I think. No, definitely, definitely. And, uh, and it touches us all. I mean, who doesn't have a mobile phone? You know, who doesn't spend, you know, significant part of our day, you know, talking to our contacts and emailing? Imagine if that security was compromised. Mm. I mean, it's unimaginable. I don't want anybody to suffer that. It's horrible, you know. It's one of the worst experiences. So mm. thinking about yourself, you can extend that into a service that touches others. And, uh, and if you're young, you're a student, you're in university, you have everything in front of you, 
try to become an innovator. Try to see what's in your right hand brain <laughs> and see if, if, if there's something that hasn't been thought out. Choose to be a game changer. Um, you know, when the Apollo program was announced by President Kennedy back in the 60s, early 1962, I think 61, he said, we're going to the moon before the decade is over. And NASA said, what? You know, we have, they said it to themselves, we have no technologies to be done. We, right. we, we need to invent everything. So from one day to the other, NASA was faced with the, having to invent hundreds, if not thousands of new technologies. So I'll tell you the story quickly. So they hired this expert in human resources, Dr. Sidney Newton Brenner. And he said, how do I choose the brightest and the most uh, genius of them all? So what he decided to do was go and do a search across history of the 100 top geniuses of history. Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Newton, you name it, you know, Einstein, all the great geniuses of history. And, uh, and using 1960 information technology, he went and asked if there was some common denominator in the, in the character traits to all these people. Were there some common beliefs to everybody that changed history? And it turned out, yes, there are these 20 principles they all followed. And the first principle of them all, which is kind of abstract, is everybody that's changed history, that's made an enormous contribution to humanity that we consider a master genius, the most important thing they had was faith in themselves, mm. a sense of destiny, a sense that you have something to contribute, which can only come from the creative mind. I do wonder though, without discounting what that person said, how would you know that they believed in themselves? Because I've been to talks about imposter syndrome and things like that, yes. and about how a lot of highly successful people have imposter syndrome. And I don't know whether unless you, the person tells you that they believe in themselves or not, how you would know that? You would know by their conduct, by their ability to do strange things, you know, to quit everything and take risks. Mm. So, you know, Stephen Jobs, you know, said, stay hungry, stay foolish. And others basically consider you crazy. So you, to be an entrepreneur and pursue an entirely new idea that you think is going to change the world requires a certain degree of craziness. You know, craziness yes. in the sense that you're not in that box. So if we could basically go back to the old framing of right brain and right hand brain and left hand brain, where the left hand is very meticulous, it's very stiff upper lip. It's only that which is regulated. It's one step after the other, one foot after the other, yes? Mm. And the right is the possibility to make leaps, to make quantum leaps, and to hold beliefs that are unreasonable. Mm. So the creativity that we're calling for in cybersecurity, it's, it's unreasonable. You must, you know, if you're going to change the, the, the landscape, you must have this belief that somehow destiny puts you there to do it and that you have a special talent. So I guess it's up to every one of us to discover that inside of you, but to nurture it and to know that this is the natural way of life, where the great advances, the great discoveries, the great changes have come from this uh, uncommon faith that you could do it, that it was you who could do it in your space, in your, in your realm, in your home, in your company, in your family, or in the world. Mm, perfect. Well, I think that's a great note to end on, but I like to ask my guests at the end of every episode something that they can recommend to our listeners. So it can be cyber-related, or it can just be a book that you're reading, or a show you've been to, or a museum. <laughs> so um, have you got something that you have enjoyed recently? Well, I'm going to recommend what I recommended to you, which is if you're yeah. in London and you have a chance to visit the uh, British Technology Museum, the, uh, it's, it's an amazing day, it's an amazing visit of, of innovation and creativity and you can see side by side all of the machines that have defined our era and it's kind of fun to see the Apple one you know already there and the Mac and some of the things that my generation grew up with already in a museum you know so the VCR cameras and, and some of the earlier inventions were there and the second one um, I would recommend if you can uh, and to get a little bit more exposed with science and this whole thing is uh, have a look at the lectures on physics by Feynman, which is a tall order, but I think it's kind of interesting. So if you heard all this quantum this and quantum that, 
there's a book that's called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, which has very little science in it, but it's about the pleasure of finding things out for yourself. It's the pleasure of curiosity. It's how scientists think, you know, you want to learn why it's that way, you know, oh. how does it work? So the pleasure of finding things out, and surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, are very worthy. And if you have more gumption for technology and for quantum and what it all means, the lectures on physics are just amazing. You can get it on audio <laughs> and listen to it in traffic. And, uh, and if you're in London, the British Museum is amazing. Thank you. So how can people stay in touch with you if they'd like to? Uh, come to our website, qlight.uk. So Q as in Quebec, light.uk, qlight.uk. Mm -hmm. And uh, come and see us stand 33, just at the back. And ping Alice, who will make sure that she has a hold of us. She can get a hold of us. Well, thank you, Florin. Well, my recommendation this month is going to be a book, because as listeners of the show know, I am a big book lover. As we're talking about art and creativity, I'm going to recommend a book called A History of Art Without Men. Mm. And this talks about some really prominent artists through history who have been overlooked and their art wasn't celebrated. Quite often, you know, throughout this episode, when we're talking about innovators within the art space, we name Michelangelo, Caravaggio, all of these names come slip off the tongue. We know them, they're household names. Can we name any female artists? And um, there's Frida Kahlo, but generally most people can't name more than two or three female artists, whereas you can name endless male artists. And it's not because they haven't existed, it's because they were not celebrated at the time. So that's a fantastic resource for anyone who's interested in art and wants to look back at periods all the way from the Renaissance to modern art and discover some really amazing female artists that were either celebrated in their time and then forgotten with history or they were completely overlooked. That's my recommendation. But thank you so much for watching and I hope you found this episode valuable. Do make sure to subscribe because we are a new podcast and we really appreciate anyone who has included us in their newsletters and on social media and those guys who are in the audience as well. We've got some Cyber Made Human stickers. But thank you for watching. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.